Okay, a couple, a couple other quick things I want to do that uh, I should have mentioned this a second ago. Merlinda and Gonkey, you guys remember Merlinda uh, was here going to school and, and Mary Gonkey from, um, from Africa. Uh, they, I think, I don't have the announcement, I think it's March 15th or something like that, 12th. Uh, they're hoping to get Gonkey's green card official so that he can start working. And so she's asked for us to be praying about that. So another thing we're doing, we're now recording, video recording our, our Sunday morning services to put on YouTube. And so this may sound odd, but everybody look back there at the sound booth and there's a camera back there and on the count of three I want everybody to wave and say hi Merlinda and Gonky. Are you guys ready? One, two, three. Hi Merlinda and Gonky. So we love you guys. We're praying that everything works out and that uh, we're, we're so thankful for our relationship with you guys. Um, so if you guys weren't here last Sunday, I'm not sure if everybody got to meet um, Connor or not, but Van got to baptize Connor this last Sunday and so we're so excited for, for Connor. And uh, I know there's a couple of other uh, people studying about baptism that we're excited about. We're, we're, we're excited to see God working in people's lives. And, and uh, even in the middle of hard things going on, it's encouraging to me to hear how God is working in other people's lives. And so this doesn't have anything to do with my lesson, but I just want to share these two stories with you guys. And while I'm sharing these two stories, you guys can open up to Exodus chapter 2. Um, one story is, uh, that means a lot to me is uh, Tammy and I have a friend from college. Her name is Kathy. And Kathy got married several years ago. And her husband, uh, when her husband's father died, he slipped into a very bad depression that led to a lot of alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, and so bad that they ended up separating, they ended up divorcing. Um, and it's just been tragic. It's been horrible hearing and, 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 and hearing the stories as she's gone through this. But we serve a God who brings beauty out of ashes. Amen? And so I am so excited because this Saturday, March 9th, uh, they are going to be remarried. And they are, and God has done, that's right, God has done some beautiful, amazing things in their life. And so just, uh, even though there's some crazy things going on in me and Tammy's life and some hard things in, in our life, man, when Tammy, or when, when uh, Kathy told me that, I was on cloud nine because somebody that I love, even though I may be going through a valley, I may be going through a hard time, God is still doing powerful things in other places. Amen? Amen. So I got to tell you this story, and I wish more people were here, but I'm going to tell you anyways. So you guys know that, that Brad and Kirsten and Tammy and I, that we've been living in our tiny houses on the church property. And thank you guys. That's been wonderful. It's been amazing. And the way that it works with Boulder County land use is they say, we're fine with you doing that. But if a neighbor ever complains, you guys have to find somewhere else to move. And so finally, a neighbor did complain, and that's okay. Jesus loves them, even though they complained. Um, and, uh, and, and so honestly, I got to be very, very real with you guys. In December, I was panicked. I was stressed. And we weren't going to be homeless. We weren't going to, it wasn't like we were getting a disease or anything like that or being kicked out of the country. It was just going to be a real pain. And I was a little panicked. And I'm so thankful for my wife who just said, you know what? Just calm down. In all of December, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to start telling people. We're not going to start looking for a place. We're just going to put our trust in God and let God work in us during this hard time. And I didn't like that idea. I wanted to make things happen, okay? Uh, and so I said, okay, fine, fine, fine. And man, December was one of the best and hardest months I've had in a long time. Trusting God with that, being angry about things, being upset, being excited, being hopeful. I mean, it was a roller coaster uh, really for us. And so January finally came along and man, I, made, I had like a list of 30 things. Here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. And one of the things that, I, that, that Tammy and I wanted to do is we noticed that right across the street, as you guys exit out, there's a white and green house. Uh, James pointed out to us two years ago that that house had a tiny house parked in their backyard. And Tammy and I actually went over and to, to, to meet that family. We met the, the wife and, and, and uh, that house, that tiny house was gone. And so Tammy and I, we were wondering, I wonder if they got kicked off the property, if a neighbor complained, or if they just moved on. So come January, probably, I don't know, like January 5th or 6th or something like that, I'm driving past that, uh, that, that house and I'm thinking I need to stop by this week and talk to that family to find out if they, that person got kicked off or just moved. And as I'm driving by, there's an elderly man out there with his snowblower. It's turned over and he's working on it. 
And I think, well, I should probably go in and offer to help. And so I pull in and I introduce myself and I say, can I help with your snowblower? He's like, sure. So we pull it in the garage and, and we work on it. Now, if you know me, you'd be laughing really hard that I have, that I have tools and I'm trying to work on something mechanical, okay? Uh, and we get it fixed and, and I'm getting ready to do my ask, okay? I've been working on how to be charming and how to ask this for over for like two months, you know? All right. And so I just ask him, I say, hey, you used to have a tiny house on this property, right? And, and then I'm getting ready to do my, well, let me, t- let me give you a great opportunity and all this kind of stuff. And he says, yes, we did have a tiny house here. She moved and oh, I wish that we could have another tiny house here on the property so that somebody could help me out every now and then like you just did. And I'm telling you guys, I, 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 I had to physically try not to laugh out loud because I would have sound crazy. But in my mind, I was seriously like, really, God, I don't even get to ask. I don't, you're not even giving me a chance to be a part of this. And so I am so thankful we are across the street with Robert and Ann Lawrence. Uh, and they are, Robert is 93 and just had her birthday yesterday. She's 89. And they just said, we would just like to have somebody close by when we have an emergency, if something ever happens. And so God provides Jehovah Jireh. Amen. And so, man, we are, and, and I told Tammy when that happened, I said, e- I, even if it doesn't work out for us to move across the street, that was just a hug from a God, I felt like. Just him saying, Rob, you're my son. You're my boy. I've got you. Just put your trust in me. So all that has nothing to do with my lesson. Let's pray and then we'll get, we'll get going here. <laughs> Father, you are good. And, our, and, and forgive us for the times that we get angry at you because our life doesn't work out the way we want it to work out. Forgive us when we get angry at you because you don't have the timing that we have. Father, We know that you don't say yes to everything we ask. We know that every story doesn't turn out perfect. We know that sometimes the story ends with you saying no to our prayer request. We know sometimes the story ends with death or disease not leaving that person. But Father, we want to remember and we want to celebrate the times that we see you work powerfully and be thankful for that. So Lord, we ask, even at this church this morning, is, is there some people here this morning that, man, they feel so close to you and they're on a mountaintop and they feel great about their relationship? Praise God. And we know that this morning there's some in this room that they're hurting and they're struggling. And Father, you are with them just as much as those who are on the mountaintop. Lord, help us be a church that surrounds people in a powerful way like that. We love you and we ask these things in your son's name. And the church says, amen. Well, turning to Exodus chapter 2, uh, we are doing our shape study. Now, I've got, a, I've got a question. Has anybody noticed as we've gone through, we talked about S, spiritual gifts. We've talked about H, heart. What kind of heart has God given you? What kind of heart do you have for other people? A, we talked about last week, abilities. What skills do you have? Now, do you notice that I have down here, it says passion, but up at the top, what does it say? Personality. So I just got to make a confession. Uh, we're we're going to talk about personality also, but I've been here for a little over three years, and I've been dying to do a sermon that I heard years ago about passion, and so I thought, I'm sticking it in here anyways. And, and so really, uh, this idea of passion uh, that we're going to be talking about this morning, it really ties in better, uh, not so much with personality, but really more with your heart, okay? And so uh, I, I, every Sunday that I prepare lessons, man, during the week, I listen to two or three different sermons, and I read some commentaries and listen to podcasts and things like that. Uh, and I have a funny term that I, I stole from a friend. He said, I, I don't, he said, when it comes to preaching, I milk a lot of cows, but I churn my own butter. Uh, so by the time he gets done, it's his own sermon, okay? Well, I gotta be honest. This morning, I'm just still in Bill Hybels. He's a preacher. I'm still on a sermon of his that talks about passion called Holy Discontent. It's like 98% his and 2% mine. That's milk, not butter. Anyways, uh, and so uh, on the uh, 27th, we're on, I'm sorry, March 17th, we are going to end up talking about personality types. And you guys that got to be a part of the class where we talked about Enneagrams, man, that's amazing, incredible stuff. And, and God has wired us in some really neat ways. And so we'll be talking about that on the 17th. So I know I'm kind of breaking the rules on the, 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 uh, the, the acronym there, but you're a Christian, you have to forgive me. Okay, so Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 through 12. Let's read together. Exodus chapter 2. This is talking about Moses. In the course of time, Moses grew up 
Now, if you've grown up in the church, you've heard the story, you know that, that Moses was a Hebrew child. He was a Hebrew baby. And that Pharaoh, during that time, realized that the Hebrews were getting uh, so large in number and so powerful that he became fearful and he made the Hebrews their slaves, Egyptian slaves. And they said, we want you to kill every newborn baby boy. And Moses was rescued. He was put in the basket. He was sent down the river. And Pharaoh's daughter found him. And just the first part of the story is beautiful and amazing. Where Pharaoh's daughter found him and said, I, need, I want to keep this child, but I need somebody to nurse this child. So Moses' mother got to raise Moses in the house of Pharaoh. Just the beginning of the story is amazing. So as Moses grew up, uh, then he went to see his own people, the Hebrews, and watched them suffering under forced labor. They were being forced to work for Pharaoh to build various things. He saw a Hebrew, one of his own people, being beaten by an Egyptian. And we're assuming that Egyptian was, well, was a soldier. But, but the, the, I, let me kind of ask you this question. Have you ever been up close and seen somebody, this isn't is a very nice way to start off the morning, physically beaten up? Have you ever had that situation? It is, uh, it's not a good feeling. It feels very, uh, it makes you sick to your stomach. The sights, the sounds of somebody being hit, of somebody being kicked, of blood splattering, it is a very disturbing image. Uh, the, the closest thing I've had to that is when I was in high school, uh, there, were two, there was one guy from one town that was like the toughest guy in, in Edmond, Oklahoma, and there was another guy in another town, Guthrie, he was the toughest guy, and I remember hundreds of people showed up out in this parking lot to watch these two guys fight, and I was in high school, and I remember I was a long ways away, and I couldn't see what was going on, but I just remember being in the crowd going, this just feels dark, this feels evil. And, and so that's what's going on, that, that Moses sees one of his own people being physically hit and kicked and beaten by another person because that person has power and authority over them. And it goes on to say in verse 12 that Moses, he looked all around, he looked this way and that way, and when he didn't see anyone, he began to fight that Egyptian soldier. As a matter of fact, as they began to fight they ended up fighting to the point that he beat the Egyptian to death. Beat him to death. Not unconscious, to death. And then buried him in the sand. Wow, what a violent story. I, think, I just remember as a kid, we would kind of breeze over that really quickly. But, but to beat somebody to, to the point that you take their life, there's got to be a lot of anger and bitterness and frustration there. Now we fast forward because he, he beat that man and hid, hid the man in, in, in the sand. Uh, he found out that people knew about it. So he ran and he hid. For 40 years he hid in a foreign country. And you guys know the story of the burning bush most likely if you've grown up in the church. That as Moses was a shepherd in his 80s. In his 80s, God still had big plans for him, even though he was way past retirement age. In his 80s, he is out with the sheep and he sees a bush that's burning and it grabs his attention because it's not consuming the bush. And he walks over to look at it and God speaks to him and he says, take off your shoes because you are on what? You're on holy ground. And so he takes off his sandals and God begins to speak to Moses and tell Moses that he has a plan for how he wants to use Moses. We read in uh, Exodus 3 verse 7, the Lord said, I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt and I have heard the cr they're crying out. Because of the slave drivers, I know how much they're suffering. Forty years ago, Moses saw one of his own people being oppressed and being beaten and being taken advantage of. And there was something inside of him that snapped and that made him so angry that he couldn't stand still. He had to fight back. And God, 40 years later, comes to Moses and says, Moses... That day how you felt when you saw and you heard the sounds of that beating and you saw the sights of the blood spattering and, and that person being abused and taken advantage of, how angry that made you and how something inside of you snapped. Moses, I hear the cries of my people who are suffering and I am angry too. And I want to do something about their suffering. 
Verse 9, I have heard the cry of the people of Israel. I have seen how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you can bring my people Israel out of Egypt. Up two weeks ago, we talked about what is your heart wired for? Who, who's a group of people maybe that you're passionate about that you want to help? And typically, we, we try to kind of say, what are you interested in? What feels good? What brings you joy? Go and work with those kind of people. And that's a great thing to do. You should do that. But this morning, I want to talk about what do you hate? What makes you angry? What takes your stomach and knots it up inside when you see it happening and you just... There's something inside of you that wants to burst. Because it could be that that is the very thing that God is saying to you, I want to send you to make a difference in those people's lives who are being abused. Those people's lives where they're being hurt and neglected and treated poorly. What is it that you hate? Because God might want to use that to change things in other people's lives. Bill Hybels, as he, as, as he did this sermon, he, he had this great quote. Well, let me read it. He says, I think what's really happening here is God is saying to Moses, what you saw that day that made you so unbelievably angry, what you saw when the Egyptian guy was beating the living daylights out of a Hebrew slave, what you have been seeing, I have been seeing. I have been hearing. I have been watching. And I can't stand it anymore either, Moses. It breaks me up, and it's time to make a change. And he's saying to Moses, Moses, I see a passion in you for your people. I see your emotions. I see a man who can't stand idly by anymore while others are being oppressed. And he says, I'm going to harness that internal firestorm of frustration that's raging in you, and I'm going to harness that and use it in a positive way to set my people free. Now, that's all really heavy. I mean, we just got to talk about beatings and murder and, and what do you hate, what makes you angry. So let's, let's kind of chill for a second, okay? Let's, let's go this a different way, all right? Let's come at this over a different angle, okay? Uh, growing up as a kid, cartoon that came all the time was Popeye the Sailor. It's Popeye the Sailor, man. All right, I've got to keep you guys awake, so I've got to throw this out, okay? Now, Popeye, he was just a good old guy. He was a sailor man. He kind of mind his own business. But Popeye was in love with a beautiful woman, and that beautiful woman's name was what? Was olive oil. And boy, how do you look at her? When you look at her, she, I mean, she's a looker. Come on. I mean, shorty, how'd you get so fly? That's all I can think when I see, I mean, look at those feet and man, that figure and that hairdo. Woo! Olive oil. She's a looker. Okay. And man, Popeye, he was in love with olive oil and she was in love with him. And in every episode, pretty much something would end up happening where olive oil would be getting in trouble. Somebody would be trying to kidnap her or, or hurt her. And, and, and for a while, Popeye would be kind of mild-mannered, but there would finally come a moment where Popeye would get so angry and he couldn't stand it anymore and he had a saying, some of you might know it, he would say, I can't take, or what, I, I've, I've taken as much as I can and I can't take what? No more. Maybe you guys didn't grow up hearing that, okay? I've taken as much as I can and I can't take no more. I don't think the English is very good on that. We don't have uh, Henry here this morning to tell us if that's good English or not, okay? And then what would happen? Popeye would take out a can of what? spinach and he would eat that spinach and as soon as he ate that spinach he would become super strong and and most of that strength would go into where just into his biceps i mean look he's that is not possible those forearms would fall off his body okay and man he would go and he would fight and he would rescue his olive oil and it was what man what a great story i loved that all right i loved that as a kid but he would get to the point that he would say i can't take no more and he would have to fight and rescue his olive oil. And this morning, I'm wondering, have you ever had a moment in your life where you've had a Popeye moment where you have said, I've taken as much as I can and I can't take no more. Really quick, I want to run through several stories of people that have had that moment. What about David? David, when he was a little boy, probably about 12 or 13, he was the youngest out of all of his brothers. His older brothers were warriors. He goes out to bring them lunch out of the battlefield. And when he shows up, there's a huge Philistine who is trash-talking God. And David hears this. And David, he just, he can't believe that nobody's doing anything about this. And so David has that moment where he says, I can't, takes no more. And so he goes and he gets himself a couple of stones. And this little boy runs out with just a slingshot to take on this powerful, powerful giant, this powerful warrior. 
David couldn't take this guy trash-talking his God any longer. Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, he was a well-educated young man. He was a preacher at a good-sized church. And he could have spent his whole life just preaching and loving his little community and staying out of the limelight and staying out of a lot of trouble. But he heard about all and he was experiencing, he was seeing all the abuse and all the bigotry that was going on around him, not just from white people, but even from white Christians and white churches. And there is something in Martin Luther King that says, I hate that. That isn't right. I can't take that anymore. Martin Luther, he, he said early on in, in, in his ministry, in his career, he said, I have no doubt me stepping into this arena will ruin my life. I have no doubt I'll probably be martyred. I have no doubt that I am in some ways, this is so unfair for my family and for my children, but I can't stand any longer to stand by and watch other people mistreat my people. I've told you guys several years ago about a, a youth minister by the name of Craig. Craig was a youth minister at a big church, and, and same thing. Craig could have just stayed doing youth ministry. He was getting a good paycheck. But Craig started working with young men who they were addicted with online pornography. And as he started working with them and seeing how that was tearing them up, he realized that a lot of the divorces that were happening in, happening in his church were because of a husbands who were addicted to online pornography. And Craig just had a moment where he thought... I can't take this anymore. This thing is destroying these young men. This thing is destroying these families. It's destroying the church. And everybody's being quiet about it. Nobody's willing to stand up against this thing. And so Craig quit his job as a youth minister and he started a website called triplexchurch.com. And it was a website to help Christians deal with their addiction with pornography. And it was a great website, and it started seminars where, where men and women could come together and talk about their addictions and get help, and it had different software that would help you stay away from websites you shouldn't go to. But he, what I love about Craig's story, that's already a great story, but what's even better is that he realized as he was working with the church that he said, Jesus wouldn't just be helping Christians with this struggle. Jesus spent time with prostitutes. And so Craig took a lot, once the first part of his ministry had taken off, was kind of running well, he let that go to somebody else who was in charge of it, and Craig turned all of his attention to working with porn stars. He started going to the places where they produced the movies. He started going to the places where girls would interview and try out for different type of videos and, and online stuff, and Craig would go with other Christians, and they would love and serve porn stars started handing out Bibles, thousands and thousands of Bibles that at the front of it said, Jesus loves porn stars. Craig looked at something that was happening to his church and to people he loved and to people he didn't even know and how they were being abused, and he said, I can't stand that. And so God used that frustration, he used that anger, that hatred to make a difference. And to this very day, they are still reaching out to porn stars, getting those ladies out of that industry, giving them training, giving them counseling, helping them escape that world. This is one of my heroes. This is Jeff Metters and his wife, Kama. Jeff Metters, uh, we're the same age, and, and, and Jeff Metters, he, he uh, started a homeless ministry in, in downtown Fort Worth where he worked mainly with the homeless adults on the streets, and he started realizing as he was working with, with people who had been homeless for 20, 30 years that, yes, we can love them, yes, we can feed them, we can give them warm clothes, but he realized we're never going to be able to get these guys and these women off the streets. They, 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 it, it's too late. They, this is all they know. And so he became very passionate about the idea of working with homeless teenagers. And on vacation one day from Dallas, he was here in Denver, and he was at a Rockies game. And as he walked up and down Pearl Street, he started looking, I'm not, I'm not the 16th Street, he started looking around, and he started realizing there are hundreds and hundreds of homeless teenagers. And God grabbed a hold of Jeff's heart, and he said, that's not right. And he realized if we work with teens, maybe we can give them the skills they need to get off the street. And what Jeff had done, matter of fact, you guys may remember this, uh, the Sevens Homeless Ministry with Benny, that's an offshoot of what Jeff Metters did 20 years ago. 
There are three or four different homeless ministries spread out across the country because Jeff Metters one day said, I can't stand to see a teenager who's being sexually or physically or mentally abused at home. So their life is so bad at home, they'd rather sleep under a bridge than live at home with their parents. And so Jeff Metter stepped in and started the ministry called Dry Bones. And God is using that in incredible ways. Bill Hybels, the guy that I'm stealing this sermon from, Bill said that he was going to school, to, uh, he was, had a business degree, and, and he already kind of knew what his future was going to be like. He knew that he was going to get a good job, and, and he had several connections. He knew he was going to do well financially. But he says as a kid growing up, his father was very involved in the church and, and really tried to help out his little home church. He says he remembered one time he invited the biggest troublemaker, the biggest hellraiser from his high school. He invited him to his church. And when that young man showed up at the church, he was so poorly treated that that young teenage boy said, I am never stepping foot in a church building again. And that broke Bill's heart. Uh, Bill's father had a friend of his that was an atheist that decided he wanted to come to church. And, 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 and so Bill's father invited him to come to their little church. And Bill said he remembered as a junior high boy saying, don't bring him to our church. If he has one ounce of interest in Jesus in his heart, we will squelch it in 45 minutes. Please don't bring him to our home church. And they did. And it went horribly. And that man never stepped foot into a church again. And that wrecked Bill's heart. That made him so angry that his little church that his father poured into and tried to help, all they cared about was themselves. They didn't care about the lost. They didn't care about the hurting. They didn't care about those who were addicted to things. All they cared about was their holy huddle. And something inside of Bill Hybel snapped, especially he said one day, after he had moved away off to college and finished college, he heard that that little church that he had grown up in, that it had been put up for sale. It had gotten so self-centered, it had gotten so small that it had died and they had to close the doors and sell it. And Bill Heibel says, I drove a six-hour round trip. I drove all the way to that church building that I grew up in. And I sat in the parking lot and I cried. And it tore me up and it broke me up inside. And I was angry and I was sad and I was emotional. And he said, and I didn't want to leave. He said, I sat there for hours just angry and crying and bitter and frustrated and broken and mad because that church didn't have to die. And he said that is the day that he had his Popeye moment. That he says, I've taken as much as I can take, I can't take no more. And Bill Heibel began to pour himself into training church leaders so that they could help dying churches grow again. So let me ask you, Boulder Valley family, what makes you angry? What breaks your heart? What makes you mad? What makes you passionate? What has God put inside you? Maybe it's broken marriages. Maybe you guys have seen how it's so easy not for people to not take care of their marriage the way they should, and it ends up in divorce, and it's not pretty, it's not easy. It ends up hurting the family. It ends up hurting those around them. It hurts. Is it divorce? Is that what breaks your heart? Does that make you mad? Maybe it's homelessness. Maybe it's when you see these people inside the street, and, and you, you look at them, and you know you do need help. You're not just out there begging for money, trying to trick me. You are in desperate need of, of food and a warm place to stay. Is there anything inside you that breaks or makes you angry when you see that? Maybe it's abuse, children being abused. When you hear those stories, is there something inside of you that makes you go, I can't take that? Maybe it's human trafficking. This isn't crazy. Did you know there are more people who are indentured slaves who are in human trafficking today in 2019 than there has ever been in the history of the world. That's going on today. When you hear that, does it make you sick to your stomach? Maybe it's just clean water. 
They say within the next 20 years, most world wars, most, most, most uh, problems uh, fighting in, in different parts of the country won't be over property, it won't be over land, it won't be over oil, it will be over water. And right now, there are thousands and tens of thousands of children who they will die every day just because they don't have clean drinking water anywhere close to them. When you hear that, does that do anything to you? Maybe it's drug abuse. Maybe you've seen what that can do to your friends or your family, and it breaks your heart when you think about how those chemicals steal life from others. What is it that breaks your heart? Because here's what we do way too often. We make sure that we insulate ourselves and we protect ourselves from any type of hurt, from any type of pain as much as we possibly can. When we get, lots of times when we get around a situation where we see somebody that's suffering, somebody that's hurting, the first thing we kind of do is we try to kind of distance ourselves or we try to numb the pain. Let's go see a movie. Let's get dinner. Let's go on vacation. We do everything we can do to make sure we don't be around things that make us uncomfortable and things that hurt us and break our heart and I am begging you this morning don't do that if God has put on your heart anything that you go I hate that I, I want to make a difference in that world don't run from it go and sit in the middle of it and let it wreck you let it break your heart because it could be that just like with Moses God says I'm going to use you to change that thing. The way I've shaped you, the gifts I've given you, the heart I've given you, the abilities, the experiences, the personality I've given you, I've made you in a perfect way for you to step into those areas and for you to start to love one person at a time. You may not change the entire world, but you have the ability to change the world of one person. Amen? So, let me read this thing before we finish up. There's a reason why you guys have grown up just like you did and, and why you've experienced what you've experienced and why you've seen what you've seen and why you have felt the things that you've felt in the past. And I hope and I pray that something painful in life has gripped you. I know that doesn't sound like an attractive prayer or hope, but I hope that something painful has gripped you and that it stirs inside of you. And I'm praying that you find something in life that makes you so angry that you just can't take it anymore and that you will let it wreck you. Because whatever that thing ends up being, chances are it also wrecks the heart of God. A couple of years ago, maybe about a year and a half ago, we did a, a, a sermon series called Dangerous Prayers. And I realized this morning I cropped this picture really odd, awkwardly. It looks like just her, her shirt is on fire. Uh, if, you, if you cropped it further down, you'd see her hands. She has praying hands, and her hands are on fire. And so the idea of dangerous prayers, I really loved that thing. But this just looks like poor lady. She, she fell asleep smoking or something like that, okay? All right. But as we finish up this morning, here's the challenge I want to give you. Are you willing to pray a very dangerous prayer? And the dangerous prayer is simply this. Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. And I know as I say all this and you hear this, you go, this does not sound enjoyable. This sounds painful. This sounds miserable. This sounds, this, this sounds like an inconvenience. And ironically, if God puts something in your heart where you want to make a difference, it will be hard. It will be painful. But you know what? It'll also breathe life into you. It'll be a fire in your bones. And you go from Christianity being, I've given my life to Christ, I came out of the water, and now I'm not sinning anymore, and I'm waiting for him to come back and get me. That isn't how God calls us. He has rescued you, and now he wants you to use you to rescue others. Let's pray.
all, and he was experiencing, he was seeing all the abuse and all the bigotry that was going on around him, not just from white people, but even from white Christians and white churches. And there is something in Martin Luther King that says, I hate that. That isn't right. I can't take that anymore. Martin Luther, he, he said early on in, in, in his ministry, in his career, he said, I have no doubt me stepping into this arena will ruin my life. I have no doubt I'll probably be martyred. I have no doubt that I am in some ways, this is so unfair for my family and for my children, but I can't stand any longer to stand by and watch other people mistreat my people. I've told you guys several years ago about a, a youth minister by the name of Craig Craig was a youth minister at a big church, and, and same thing. Craig could have just stayed doing youth ministry. He was getting a good paycheck. But Craig started working with young men who they were addicted with online pornography. And as he started working with them and seeing how that was tearing them up, he realized that a lot of the divorces that were happening in, happening in his church were because of a husband who were addicted to online pornography. And Craig just had a moment where he thought... I can't take this anymore. This thing is destroying these young men. This thing is destroying these families. It's destroying a church. And everybody's being quiet about it. Nobody's willing to stand up against this thing. And so Craig quit his job as a youth minister and he started a website called triplexchurch.com. And it was a website to help Christians deal with their addiction with pornography. And it was a great website, and it started seminars where, where men and women could come together and talk about their addictions and get help, and it had different software that would help you stay away from websites you shouldn't go to. But he, what I love about Craig's story, that's already a great story, but what's even better is that he realized as he was working with the church that he said, Jesus wouldn't just be helping Christians with this struggle. Jesus spent time with prostitutes. And so Craig took a lot once the first part of his ministry had taken off was kind of running well he let that go to somebody else who was in charge of it and Craig turned all of his attention to working with porn stars he started going to the places where they produce the movies he started going to the places where girls would interview and try out for different type of videos and, and online stuff and Craig would go with other Christians and they would love and serve porn stars started handing out Bibles, thousands and thousands of Bibles that at the front of it said, Jesus loves porn stars. Craig looked at something that was happening to his church and to people he loved and to people he didn't even know and how they were being abused, and he said, I can't stand that. And so God used that frustration, he used that anger, that hatred to make a difference. And to this very day, they are still reaching out to porn stars, getting those ladies out of that industry, giving them training, giving them counseling, helping them escape that world. This is one of my heroes. This is Jeff Metters and his wife, Kama. Jeff Metters, uh, we're the same age, and, and, and Jeff Metters, he, he uh, started a homeless ministry in, in downtown Fort Worth where he worked mainly with the homeless adults on the streets, and he started realizing as he was working with, with people who had been homeless for 20, 30 years that, yes, we can love them, yes, we can feed them, we can give them warm clothes, but he realized we're never going to be able to get these guys and these women off the streets. They, 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 it, it's too late. They, this is all they know. And so he became very passionate about the idea of working with homeless teenagers. And on vacation one day from Dallas, he was here in Denver, and he was at a Rockies game. And as he walked up and down Pearl Street, he started looking, I'm not, I'm not the 16th Street, he started looking around, and he started realizing there are hundreds and hundreds of homeless teenagers. And God grabbed a hold of Jeff's heart and he said that's not right and he realized if we work with teens maybe we can give them the skills they need to get off the street and what Jeff had done matter of fact you guys may remember this, uh, the sevens homeless ministry with Benny that's an offshoot of what Jeff Metters did 20 years ago there are three or four different homeless ministries spread out across the country because Jeff Metters one day said I can't stand to see a teenager who's being sexually or physically or mentally abused at home. So their life is so bad at home, they'd rather sleep under a bridge than live at home with their parents. And so Jeff Metter stepped in and started the ministry called Dry Bones. And God is using that in incredible ways. Bill Hybels, the guy that I'm stealing this sermon from, 
Bill said that he was going to school, to, uh, he was, had a business degree, and, and he already kind of knew what his future was going to be like. He knew that he was going to get a good job, and, and he had several connections. He knew he was going to do well financially. But he says as a kid growing up, his father was very involved in the church and, and really tried to help out his little home church. He says he remembered one time he invited the biggest troublemaker, the biggest hell raiser from his high school. He invited him to his church. And when that young man showed up to church, he was so poorly treated that that young teenage boy said, I'm never stepping foot in a church building again. And that broke Bill's heart. Uh, Bill's father had a friend of his that was an atheist that decided he wanted to come to church. And, 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 and so Bill's father invited him to come to their little church. And Bill said he remembered as a junior high boy saying, don't bring him to our church. If he has one ounce of interest in Jesus in his heart, we will squelch it in 45 minutes. Please don't bring him to our home church. And they did. And it went horribly. And that man never stepped foot into a church again. And that wrecked Bill's heart. That made him so angry that his little church that his father poured into and tried to help, all they cared about was themselves. They didn't care about the lost. They didn't care about the hurting. They didn't care about those who were addicted to things. All they cared about was their holy huddle. And something inside of Bill Heibel snapped, especially, he said, one day, after he had moved away off to college, and finished college, he heard that that little church that he had grown up in, that it had been put up for sale. It had gotten so self-centered, it had gotten so small that it had died and they had to close the doors and sell it. And Bill Heibel says, I drove a six-hour round trip. I drove all the way to that church building that I grew up in and I sat in the parking lot and I cried and it tore me up and it broke me up inside and I was angry and I was sad and I was emotional and he said and I didn't want to leave. He said I sat there for hours just angry and crying and bitter and frustrated and broken and mad because that church didn't have to die. And he said that is the day that he had his Popeye moment. That he says, I've taken as much as I can take, I can't take no more. And Bill Heibel began to pour himself into training church leaders so that they could help dying churches grow again. So let me ask you, Boulder Valley family, what makes you angry? What breaks your heart? What makes you mad? What makes you passionate? What has God put inside you? Maybe it's broken marriages. Maybe you guys have seen how it's so easy not for people to not take care of their marriage the way they should and it ends up in divorce and it's not pretty, it's not easy. It ends up hurting the family. It ends up hurting those around them. It hurts. Is it divorce? Is that what breaks your heart? Does that make you mad? Maybe it's homelessness. Maybe it's when you see these people inside the, the street and, and you, you look at them and you know you do need help. You're not just out there begging for money trying to trick me. You are in desperate need of, of food and a warm place to stay. Is there anything inside you that breaks or makes you angry when you see that? Maybe it's abuse. Children being abused. When you hear those stories, is there something inside of you that makes you go, I can't take that? Maybe it's human trafficking. This isn't crazy. Did you know there are more people who are indentured slaves who are in human trafficking today in 2019 than there has ever been in the history of the world. That's going on today. When you hear that, does it make you sick to your stomach? Maybe it's just clean water. They say within the next 20 years, most world wars, most, most, most uh, problems uh, fighting in, in different parts of the country won't be over property, it won't be over land, it won't be over oil, it will be over water. And right now, there are thousands and tens of thousands of children who they will die every day just because they don't have clean drinking water anywhere close to them. When you hear that, does that do anything to you? Maybe it's drug abuse. Maybe you've seen 
what that can do to your friends or your family, and it breaks your heart when you think about how those chemicals steal life from others. What is it that breaks your heart? Because here's what we do way too often. We make sure that we insulate ourselves and we protect ourselves from any type of hurt, from any type of pain as much as we possibly can. When we get, lots of times when we get around a situation where we see somebody that's suffering, somebody that's hurting, the first thing we kind of do is we try to kind of distance ourselves or we try to numb the pain. Let's go see a movie. Let's get dinner. Let's go on vacation. We do everything we can do to make sure we don't be around things that make us uncomfortable and things that hurt us and break our heart and I am begging you this morning don't do that if God has put on your heart anything that you go I hate that I, I want to make a difference in that world don't run from it go and sit in the middle of it and let it wreck you let it break your heart because it could be that just like with Moses God says I'm going to use you to change that thing. The way I've shaped you, the gifts I've given you, the heart I've given you, the abilities, the experiences, the person now that I've given you, I've made you in a perfect way for you to step into those areas and for you to start to love one person at a time. You may not change the entire world, but you have the ability to change the world of one person. Amen? So, let me read this thing before we finish up. There's a reason why you guys have grown up just like you did and, and why you've experienced what you've experienced and why you've seen what you've seen and why you have felt the things that you felt in the past. And I hope and I pray that something painful in life has gripped you. I know that doesn't sound like an attractive prayer or hope, but I hope that something painful has gripped you and that it stirs inside of you. And I'm praying that you find something in life that makes you so angry that you just can't take it anymore and that you will let it wreck you. Because whatever that thing ends up being, chances are it also wrecks the heart of God. A couple of years ago, maybe about a year and a half ago, we did a, a, a sermon series called Dangerous Prayers. And I realized this morning I cropped this picture really odd, awkwardly. It looks like just her, her shirt is on fire. Uh, if, you, if you cropped it further down, you'd see her hands. She has praying hands, and her hands are on fire. And so the idea of dangerous prayers, I really loved that thing. But this just looks like, poor lady, she's, she fell asleep smoking or something like that. Okay, all right. But as we finish up this morning, here's the challenge I want to give you. Are you willing to pray a very dangerous prayer? And the dangerous prayer is simply this. Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. And I know as I say all this and you hear this, you go, this does not sound enjoyable. This sounds painful. This sounds miserable. This sounds, this, this sounds like an inconvenience. And ironically, if God puts something in your heart where you want to make a difference, it will be hard. It will be painful. But you know what? It'll also breathe life into you. It'll be a fire in your bones. And you go from Christianity being, I've given my life to Christ, I came out of the water, and now I'm not sinning anymore, and I'm waiting for him to come back and get me. That isn't how God calls us. He has rescued you, and now he wants you to use you to rescue others. Let's pray. Lord, Please, Father, I know it's hard to ask and it's hard to say, but we ask that you would break our hearts. For too long, we have, we, have, we have believed the lie that we need to constantly surround ourselves with comfort, with entertainment. We don't want to be uncomfortable. We don't want to feel awkward. We don't want to be inconvenienced by anything. Some of us have spent our entire lives in schedule building up walls so that we are safe from any type of hurt or pain. Lord, you sent your son to suffer on earth. We can learn so much by being with those who are brokenhearted. So Lord, I pray this morning that you have shaped us all in a certain way. Give us a passion for something that breaks your heart. We love you, and we ask these things in your son's name. And the church says, let's all stand and finish up this morning and sing together.
Your light broke through my night, restored exceeding joy. Your grace fell like the rain and made this desert live. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dance. <clears throat> you have turned my sorrow into joy. Your hand lifted me up. I stand on higher ground. Your praise rose in my heart and made this valley sing. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. This is how we overcome. This is how we overcome. This is how we overcome. This is how we over. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. This is how we overcome. 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 And the church says, I think we're dismissed. Have a great day. Was everybody closing? Were you closing? Is everybody closing? I don't know if it's closing. We're good. <laughs> okay. Oh, Bob was supposed to close. Sorry, Bob. Sorry, Bob. I didn't know. I didn't know what? You had to close. Oh, God. You didn't know either. I did know. No, no, you no. You did? Okay. Yeah. One of those mornings. We made it, though.